Have you ever wondered how to navigate the corporate chaos with data-driven decisions? Well, get ready to unlock the secrets of effective decision-making and propel your career forward before you're left behind. In this episode, you'll meet Bhavik Patel, a wizard of data-driven decisions and a true trailblazer in the field. His achievements speak volumes and his ability to turn data insights into product management gold is nothing short of extraordinary. And coming up on this episode, I'll show you how to master data-driven product management strategies, the secrets that drive corporate decisions with reason, and start transforming insights into results. We'll discuss how to revolutionize product management with data and how to supercharge strategies with data precision and also data's impact on product success. We'll also discuss how you can level up your product management skills and your data leadership skills. Bavik is ready to take us on a journey through the secrets of data-driven decision-making. But before that, there is one thing I wanted to know about the challenges of data capturing within product teams. Bavik, what are the specific hurdles that product managers face in this process and how can they overcome them effectively especially in working with data teams? I think even between small companies, medium-sized companies and large companies, the challenges remain the same when we're talking specifically within the product space. So when you talk about data, it's, it's kind of an all-encapsulating term. You have your data engineering teams, you have your BI teams, you have your customer analytics teams, marketing analytics. Um, and then you have product analytics, which is, I think it's, it's, it's much more nascent in the, in, in the space compared to some of these other ones. So I would say the challenges probably can be categorized into a few things. First, you have your technical challenges, which is data capture. So product teams have to create their own data. They have to be the creators of their own data. If you're a product manager, you work with engineers and designers within a specific part of your company's website, you know, the, the data doesn't just magically flow into your data warehouse or into your product analytics tool. You have to create it. You have to create those events, send them as users interact with your part of the website. So that's one challenge. I think that's a big challenge. Uh, then you have your, what do you do with that data? I think typically product teams have gotten used to being so self-reliant and working with working with other teams and, and, and other people within the organization in a way that they don't often you rely on data or use data to make those to make the best decisions. And you kind of find yourself in this in, in this place where decisions are happening with almost no data or no insight. There may be some research that's happening. But generally, it's very limited. Um, and then the once you've launched the product, there is the post-release like quantification of what you're doing. So I think it's, there's a whole bunch of things here. There are some cultural challenges. There are some technical challenges around data collection. And and, and I, th I, I genuinely do think in the product space, they exist regardless of the size of the organization. Bavik, it's really interesting that these challenges that you highlighted are found in any size company leading to solutions needed on all levels. So can you shed some light on the cultural challenges that you've observed with product teams, particularly regarding the role of product managers and their use of data, especially from the perspective of people who, who own that data inside an organization? I think I, I've always put this down to two things. There's going to be the, the challenge within the organization and then there's down to the product manager. But let's talk about the organizational challenges. If the organization is a very output-driven organization, they're never going to find themselves in a situation where they need to justify what they're doing, present the numbers, the data, the metrics, and show growth or show improvements in those metrics. So that I think that becomes the company cultural issue. And then you've got your product, like, you know, it depends on the product manager. Now, you'll know, you know, you might get product managers who are very savvy and they want to use the data, but you also get people who aren't very data savvy or they just don't believe in the data and they're very, you know, they, they prefer gut-driven decisions, maybe they've been in the game too long, or they prefer just qualitative data because it's easier to manipulate and understand, whereas quantitative data requires a lot of inference of the data. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think I think it comes down to two things. There's, a, there's the company level challenges, and then there's the, the individuals. Bavik, can you share your insights on how organizations can bridge the gap between, say, CTOs who often prioritize raw data and warehouses and the product teams who require actionable insights from specialized tools? If it's a CTO, the CTO is usually a very technical person and they prefer to, or they, maybe they don't know any other world, but 
they prefer to have that raw data being sent straight into a data warehouse, which they then you know they can probably access, or they know their software engineers can access, or even their data engineering team can access. But actually, they forget that, that often they're not the consumers of this data. The consumers of this data, the people who need it, are the product managers um, and the product teams and designers, and they're not going to have the technical know-how to you know go in and out of the uh, data warehouse and be able to pull out the insights they need and manipulate it in a way that gives them what they need. Sometimes they don't, you know, they don't even know what they want to do with it. And I don't think they appreciate the fact that the people who want the data, who are the decision makers, don't know how to do that. And uh, I think I think when you work in organizations which have a product leadership team which is quite senior, you probably find in those instances they're probably a bit more receptive to having budgets that will go towards proper tooling and I think the value realization happens quickly. I, I still think there is a challenge there. The product leadership team will be like, "Oh yeah, no, let's let's pay let's pay for the, you know, the enterprise level tool. Let's pay for Amplitude. Let's pay for Heap. Let's pay for Mixpanel, whatever." Um, but I think where the challenge then comes in those situations is that paying for the tool will only get you so far. You still need people who can configure the tool, know how the schema of the data that goes into that tool needs to look like so that it's usable. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where you have a great tool, but what you're feeding is just garbage. So if interpreting and understanding data is the key to unlocking the best choice decisions, as most of our viewers know, and most of our viewers know this video is brought to you in partnership with Amplitude, who I view as the world's best product analytics tool. And Bavik, why do you think product managers are not driving their focus on upskilling themselves in data? I'd love for data people to understand it from their perspective. And this is where it becomes like this, you know, like we end up in a situation where product managers then aren't incentivized to go and look at the data. They're not incentivized to understand how to build funnels because they don't understand the value of it. If you know that these are the metrics or the outcomes you're working towards, you know how they fit in to the wider business piece, they're probably more likely to go and look for the data, understand it, upskill themselves. And I, and I agree, they're the areas they should be upskilling in. Uh, now, you might argue that, okay, that's the analyst job, but the analyst job is to go deeper into sort of like problems. I think surface level metrics and surface level data should be accessible by everyone. And, I've, and I do fundamentally believe this. No, if product managers are not incentivized to drive data understanding, would this stem from a bigger organizational issues? Could you elaborate on your thoughts around this area of organization issues and why... Maybe product managers aren't utilizing the data and is there anything we can do in data to help them? So I've worked at companies where the product team and the marketing team work very well together. You take you, you take some insight um, that's really, you know, it's kind of, oh, wow, this is really interesting. You pass it to the marketing team and you go and act off the back of it. But I think um, a lot of the times products, there is this like siloed um, way of working within product organizations. And it's kind of like there are, invisible boundaries in place where you don't cross them. And I think this is the problem is we have, there are people in, and even within organizations, you don't get this like overwhelming cultural mentality of being data driven. There are only exceptions and rules. And this is why I say like, you know, I've worked with great product managers. I don't say I've worked with great product teams. Like they've been great in, in many ways, but they haven't been the, 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 that data driven, like, hey, let's be ruthless about what we're doing. Let's really, you know, tear it apart and understand every single lever inside and how it works. It's down to the fact that, you know, as product people, you want to build great things. Having to report on them, having to show the data behind them, it's 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 kind of like a boring task. It's not sexy. As a product, you don't go into product management to build, you know, the one small element of the payment platform and integrate PayPal as, you know, there's nothing sexy about it. You want to build that thing that is like, hey, we built this and hope that it's such an overwhelmingly successful feature that you don't even need the data. It's just, it just speaks for itself. But in most instances, which we're, you know, we're operating in such iterative improvements um, that people think, well, it's not worth showing the data. Continuing on this train of thought, Bavik, what solutions would improve this utilized data? What could you do to overcome this and ultimately turn data into overall product success? So I've taken responsibility responsibility on myself as sort of like the leader in the analytics space in my team. So as head of analytics, director of analytics, I've taken it as a responsibility for me and my team to make sure this works because I I don't believe that this is like you know the product managers the product management team 
marketing team, they're not going to bake it into their own targets. I say, hey, we're responsible for self-serve. Now, it might be a case that they should be, but I feel like if, you know, as my job as a data analytics leader is to democratize data, you know, we hear this all the time, the democratization of data, democratization of data and self-serve and uh, accessibility and all these type of things. It's my job to make sure that people can access data that they need at a time they need it without having the band, uh, sorry, without having the bottlenecks of having to go through my team. But there is this still, uh, and, and some teams are really well, you know, I will say, regardless of what you think of marketing teams, they're actually very good at self-serve. They're, you know, they'll go in, they'll get their own data very quickly. They, it, it's, it's been institutionalized now for marketing teams to go into GA and understand what they're doing. For product teams, I think the, first of all, the space they're operating in is, is a little bit more complex. So I do, you know, I do want to, I, I do want to recognize the fact that it's not straightforward for product teams to go and understand what they're doing because I mean the product funnel itself, in you know, depending on your organization, it's highly complex. It's not, li it's not linear. There's going to be multiple permutations of how a journey might be built. Um, but having an idea of what the basic journey might look like should be a starting point. Um, so I think you know they're you know, they're they're in a more challenging space, but marketing teams are are much better at doing self serve. Product teams not so much. Let's dive into the topic of product management and data management mindsets. But first, I want to know what leads to better product outcomes in your opinion? What decision making can be used? And what, how can product managers strike the right balance between relying on analysts and staying informed about key metrics themselves? I work in the data space. So for me, what you're saying is like, that's like every day for me. Like analysts are generally the bearers of bad news, the grounders of all of the dreamers and the floaters. You know, like we're the ones that are kind of like, Hey, let's look at this data. It's not great. It's we need to fix this first. But this perception that being a product manager is you go to meetings and you sit by the pool and you do these really nice discovery sessions and you need to then go and wrap it up into a presentation and then you you know it's kind of like all of the the fun side of things. Actually, disaster recovery would be the lowest thing. You know, if you looked at what like product managers do, I I, can't, I don't know any product managers. Uh, if I'm being honest, who have ever thought about disaster recovery. And maybe, you know, they don't have to every product manager needs to worry about that. But I would be like, hey, do we have a, like a fail safe somewhere? Are we, each... and, and for me, that's data, right? Um, if you're, if you're looking at data regularly, you should be able to use that as your fail safe, which like, oh, look, this, these numbers are trending downwards. And it's often the analysts who bring this to the table. And this is where it becomes a fundamental issue. The analyst, of course, you know, if you're embedded, you know, you should be looking at data day in and day out. But it's the job of the product manager to keep the finger on the pulse. They should understand what is, you know, they should understand the heartbeat of their product. Is it healthy? Is it high? Is it low? What are the risks that are coming up? And as a product manager, you know, I, 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 you would argue, you might argue that a part of your job is risk management, right? And disaster recovery falls into it. Looking at the trajectory of your metrics falls into it. But sadly, that's not the reality of the product management. I, I, th I genuinely think we'll see a shift, actually. For years, product marketing and product management have been split. And I never understood why. If you're a product manager and you've built something, it should also be your role to go and explain how it works and document it and create you know, knowledge for your users. Hey, we built this thing. Like Your, ro your role shouldn't be to build it and then dark launch it out in the into the world where no one you know where only a handful of people find it it's your job to get users to that product and this is through product marketing this is working with marketing it's working with your social teams your comms teams you know, all of these type of things to get that information out product management is definitely in a period of change in the modern era of business can you elaborate on how these changes will affect the dynamics within organizations and the role of product managers specifically when it comes to data? You know, far be it for me to define what product people should be doing or they shouldn't be doing. But I always bring it back to, like, the company and the impact that you're having, right? If you're building things, in, you know, and it's not having an impact, then I, I would second, I, you know, I would question myself, I would question my leadership team. So in your, you know, one of the things I always say to my team, whenever I have, uh, if I join a new organization or I have new people join, I would say we need to start eating our own dog food. The amount of times um, 
I've worked with analysts who don't, you know, they've never tried our product. I'm not saying you need to go and pay, you know, a yearly subscription or something like that, but just go and use it, understand it, find your own pain points, right? I'm not saying, and again, I'm not, here, I'm not even here saying you are the customer. I, you know, I truly believe we're not our own customers. But if you don't know your product well enough, how can you ever, you know, talk about it? And I don't just mean, um, you know, one aspect of it. I, as a product manager, yes, you own one one piece, but that one piece is part of a much bigger puzzle. If you haven't, if you don't know how the entire puzzle works, you're never going to know the impact your piece is having on the wider, on, on you know, on the wider business. And I noticed this uh, a few years ago. I was working at Moo, um, great culture, one of my favorite companies I've ever worked at. Marketing had 99% of the target against them. So if you think about like I don't know, 100 million pound target, marketing were responsible for delivering 99% of that annual target, and the product engineering and design team had 1%. Yet they were the custodians of the product mm -hmm. held the key you know held the keys they were the ones who guarded the gates and marketing were constantly like hey we need this we need this we need this but there was all these like defenses like no we're not doing this we're prioritizing this we're doing this and for me that was the first time i realized that there's a fundamental imbalance in the world how can you give one team you know 99 of your 95 percent of your annual revenue target but give them none of the engineering and technical resources needed for them to try things and test things and deliver things it's it's not fair and that i think that was the very first time i started seeing product as this engine that should be helping to drive growth but it's so protected and it's so guarded um with all this kind of like fluffier stuff that the people who are held accountable are unable to access these tools and features and resources to be able to do their job. Actually, if you start to distribute that target and you share the burden across the organization, suddenly, in my view, you'll see a lot more upskilling of product managers in looking at data, in collaboration to hit targets. I think that's the only real way that product as an, as a, as an industry, as a field, vertical, can move forward. What a great guy. Bavik is brilliant. I could have spoken to him another few hours. So to stay connected with Bavik and his insights, Follow him on LinkedIn. And if you're ready for more knowledge on innovative data strategy, be sure to watch the next video in our series with Emily Reed on data team success and how product teams can work closer with data teams. It could reshape your career and the way you approach data. Emily is also brilliant. And a special thanks to Amplitude for the invaluable partnership in bringing this series to you. From me, Ross Webb, until next time, bye for now.